Hi, I'm Peter J. Ray. Welcome to Adventures in History. Today's topic is Millard Fillmore, Part 2. Millard Fillmore was the 13th President of the United States. We stopped last time in 1844. Millard Fillmore had uh, risen from, from poverty, very humble origins. Eventually lived in Buffalo, New York, and established himself as a very successful lawyer. He really uh, became a self-educated, very well educated and self-educated man and had very good character and did all kinds of things for Buffalo, New York, and then was elected to Congress and was become developing a very positive reputation in Congress serving his district from, from New York. In 1844, he sought the Whig nomination for president, for vice president rather. He was a member of the Whig party uh, he was not nominated, uh, but, but he was nominated for governor of New York by the Whig Party, but lost in the election. Uh, there were a lot of German immigrants, and the, uh, the, their votes were important. And the Whigs were considered anti-foreign and anti-Catholic, and this is one of the reasons he lost that election. After, the, after losing, Philomar said, quote, All is gone but honor. In 1846, uh, he founded the University of Buffalo and became the chancellor. Really good. Buffalo was a bottleneck for Great Lakes shipping. Uh, there, there was harbor improvement was needed, and there was no federal help. So he was hoping that or pushing for that so that these ships could pass through more quickly and un, uh, unload their cargo. His biographer, Robert J. Rayback, wrote about Fillmore. He said that, quote, he had a, quote, a, nas- a natural cast of mind that preferred business to show, a love of labor, a fondness for mechanical work, and a compulsive natural grasp, united to great capacity for details, energy, and inventiveness. By 1848, uh, he was the comptroller of the state of New York, elected in 47. And so he moved to Albany, since that was a state, uh, jo- state position. Robert J. Rayback wrote, quote, He plainly saw that henceforth his life was not to be passed in the quiet practice of law, but in the full blaze of public life, where he was to be a prominent actor. That same year, 1848, his son, Miller Jr., whom they called Powers, uh, started uh, college at Harvard. 1848, uh, Millard Fillmore was nominated as uh, the vice presidential nominee uh, for, with the Zachary Taylor ticket, and he, they won. So Fillmore was elected vice president in 1848, and he helped uh, Zach Taylor win the crucial New York State. And he balanced the ticket between North and South, since Fillmore was from a northerner from New York, and Zach Taylor was a southerner from, from Virginia, uh, Kentucky, and then settled in Louisiana. Uh, Zach Taylor did not campaign. However, Millard Fillmore gave many enthusiastic speeches during the campaign. So March of 1849, uh, Millard Fillmore was inaugurated as the U.S. Vice President. He traveled from Albany, New York, to Washington, D.C. His wife, Abigail, got sick, and uh, on the way, she got sick, so she returned to Buffalo. And this is uh, when when Fillmore arrived in Washington. He met Zach Taylor for the first time. They did not develop a close relationship, uh, and this was he was uh, Miller Fillmore was in kind of a tough situation here because he wasn't close with the president, and he was no longer in Congress. He was you know vice president is uh, sort of on, all alone, and he had he had kind of a tough time. His self confidence. Uh, 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 went down a little bit, and he, he was having trouble in that situation. He was lonely, living, and he lived at the Willard Hotel, professionally isolated and personally miserable. He really, you know, he wasn't in Congress, where he, which is what he was used to. The vice president has a kind of a strange situation. And another thing is that uh, President Taylor was close with William Seward, who was Millard Fillmore's New York political rival. Robert J. Rayback wrote, quote, Quiet and undramatic perseverance kept Millard Fillmore constantly on the edge of greatness. 1849, the, uh, the slavery continued to be more and more controversial, a bigger conflict between North and South. And uh, there was the issue of, of slaves uh, escaping to the North, who were called fugitive slaves by the South. And uh, 
So there are more and more uh, slaves were coming north, escaping, and especially it's because of the development of the railroad made it easier for them. You know, if they got on a railroad somehow and uh, hid somewhere, they could ma- make good time traveling north. Since 1830, the, the rise of railroads, much easier for slaves to escape by railroad. And, and that was true for Frederick Douglass in 1839, who, who got on a train in Baltimore and came north. Now, in the north, there was, uh, there, and actually at this time, there were uh, there was a, a slave catchers come, coming north trying to hunting fugitive slaves, and people in the north really hated that. The abolition movement uh, was growing stronger, and as I said, the northerners hated slave catchers roaming around. The thing is, there were lots of, there, were, there was a large uh, free black population in the north, and they were afraid that they would be taken uh, back into slavery. They would... These slave catchers that say, all right, uh, you're an escaped slave, then we're, they'd grab the guy and take him back. 1850, there was this uh, plenty of, uh, lots of uh, political uh, debate, and con- they called it the Compromise of 1850, plenty of debate over various very important issues. And the key characters included Henry Clay, Daniel Webster, John C. Calhoun, and Jefferson Davis. Folks in California and New York, Mexico wanted to join the Union as free states. And this uh, upset folks in the South because uh, this would uh, tip the balance in, in, uh, in the Senate toward the North. And there was talk of secession in the South if that happened. July of 1850, uh, Zach, President Taylor died. And that meant that uh, Millard Fillmore became the 13th, pre- 13th president upon the death of the president. And uh, he completely changed uh, Zach, uh, uh, President Ty- uh, Taylor's uh, cabinet. And so this was really something. The cloth maker's appre- apprentice became U.S. president. So he was the, yeah, he came from these very humble origins. And here he, his father was a tenant farmer growing up, very little schooling, and he'd worked in a textile mill as an apprentice, and now here he was, president of the United States. But it was all very well deserved because of his hard work and uh, self, self effort, efforts for self-improvement and self-education and good character. Now, Millard Fillmer was the last Whig president. There were only four, William Henry Harrison, John Tyler, Zach Taylor, and Fillmore. Uh, in fact, in the coming years, uh, the Whig party would, pretty, would really... Uh, wither away as the uh, modern Republican Party uh, came into being. Many Whigs became Republicans. Daniel Webster became uh, President Fillmore's Secretary of State. Now, there was one story after uh, President Taylor's death when Millard Fillmore took his oath as president. And he, the story is he went to buy a new carriage, and he found a nice one. And the owner was leaving Washington, and he was trying. He wanted to sell his carriage. And uh, Fillmore said to his attendant, according to the story, "This is all very well, Edward, but how would it do for a president of the United States to ride around in a second-hand carriage?" And uh, the the guy responded, "But sure, your ex- but sure, your excellency is only a second-hand president." I don't know if there's any truth to that story. So actually, uh, in July, yeah, for his first day in office, he changed his entire cabinet. And uh, Daniel Taylor, I'm sorry, Daniel Webster was his, the new Secretary of State, and it was his closest advisor. Now there was this, uh, now they said that uh, his critics said that uh, Miller Fillmore did not understand the strong hatred of slavery in the North. I think he did, but he also, his priority was to keep the Union one. And uh, he felt the abolition movement uh, threatened the Union. 1850, Texas claimed New Mexico and threatened to invade. President Fillmore sent 750 federal troops to protect New Mexico. And President Fillmore said this, quote, If the laws of the United States are opposed and obstructed in any state or territory by combinations too powerful to be suppressed by the judicial or civil authorities, it is the duty of the president either to call out the militia or to employ the military and naval force of the United States, or to do both if, in his judgment, the exigency of the occasion shall so require." So President Fillmore protected New Mexico from a, Tex- from a Texan takeover. Now the, uh, now the so-called uh, the Compromise of 1850, uh, which was the, the, the high point of, of President Fillmore's life, or the most important event, happened in 1850. 
And this was a, a series of, of laws, of, of uh, things that became law, and, and, and uh, they were called a compromise between North and South. And under this compromise, California entered the Union as a free state. And uh, Utah and New Mexico became territories. Uh, Texas gave up its claim to New Mexico and was paid $10 million to do so. The slave trade was banned in Washington, D.C. However, slavery continued there. Now, the most controversial aspect of the law was the Fugitive Slave Law, which was, uh, which was intended to help, help with the capture of escaped slaves in the North. And this was very controversial. Northern abolitionists were very angry about this. And uh, supposedly, uh, Harriet Peach Beecher Stowe was inspired to write her book, Uncle Tom's Cabin, based on, the, on the, um, the passage of the Fugitive Slave Law. Now, the, uh, uh, now the other thing is that uh, now the, this was controversial, and uh, although uh, the, those who uh, give Fillmore credit believe that the Compromise of 1850 delayed the Civil War 10 years. So his critics say, oh, this is terrible what they did. He, and he signed this, the Fugitive Slave Law. Uh, but again, it gave the North 10 more years in the Industrial Revolution to, to get stronger industrial, industrially to win the Civil War, because that's what it took, was, the, was industrial might to win the Civil War and to keep the United States one country. Henry Clay was the architect of the Compromise of 1850. President Fillmore signed all five bills. Now, in the Fugitive Slave Law, this uh, stipulated that there would be federal assistance to help capture escaped slaves. And the critics of the law were upset that this put, they believed that free blacks in the North were at risk. And again, the critics said that the Fugitive Slave Law Act further divided the United States. Well, that's, that's again, that's a matter of opinion. And it's not, uh, Fillmore was in, wasn't in favor of slavery, but he wanted to keep the country together. Again, this, uh, many folks in the North, this did satisfy Southerners, but many folks in the North were very, very upset. And see, Miller Fillmore was a Northerner, so this really hurt his, his political career. His biographer, biographer, Robert J. Rayback, wrote about the Compromise of 1850, quote, As if by magic, the clouds of disunion which hovered threateningly over the nation disappeared. In ten short weeks, Fillmore's administration had solved the problem of territorial government that had plagued Congress ever since American and Mexican troops first clashed four years ago, a problem that had sacrificed all else to its devouring demand for attention. Again, the, uh, now Fillmore had this to say about the Compromise of 1850 when there was all this endless talk and they couldn't work it out, and, uh, and he said this, quote, I think no event would be hailed with more gratification by the people of the United States than the amicable adjustment of questions of difficulty, which have now for a long time agitated the country and occupied to the exclusion of other subjects the time and attention of Congress. See, under the law, the C California entered the uh, Union as a uh, free state, and it looked like New Mexico and Utah would also eventually enter as, fr as free states. So, the, so this uh, pleased the North, and the South demanded the fugitive slave law because more and more slaves were escaping North. And in their perspective, they were losing their property. And now uh, President Fillmore believed in uh, the rule of law, and his critics uh, uh, condemned him for what they called his enthusiastic support for the fugitive slave law and aggressive enforcement, which again hurt, hurt him politically since he was a northerner. Under the law, it became illegal to help escape slaves. This was very offensive to f folks in the north. Now, the thing is, it's hard, it was hard to identify who was a free black in the north and who was an escaped slave. There were 150,000 free blacks in the north. The penalty under the new law for helping an escaped slave was $1,000 and six months in jail. Now the, and the, the burden of proof was weak regarding the identity of, of an escaped slave. Free blacks were at risk, and the alleged fugitive slave could not testify on his behalf. So under the law, if a slave catcher found a black guy and they, he said, all right, and he, you know, he, he uh, 
manhandled him and and said, "All right, uh, you're a, you're a, you're an escaped slave." And they would, under the law, they would have to have a, a, a court a trial, and a judge would have to rule. Now, again, another problem with the law. Under the law, the judge would receive ten dollars if he ruled that the individual was a indeed a slave, and he would only get five dollars if he ruled that he was a free free black. So that that itself was a problematic part of the law. And again, the fugitive slave law, this is the thing that people ever since have uh, have castigated Millard Fillmore and said, oh, what a terrible thing he did. Again, I disagree with that. That's a political opinion, and I disagree with it because he was doing something to preserve the Union. Abraham Lincoln had the same attitude. You know, he did also didn't like uh, slavery, but, but he believed he didn't want the country to break up. And that's why Miller Fillmore signed the law to keep the country one and from breaking up. December 2nd of 1850, President Fillmore gave his first annual message, and he said, quote, The government of the United States is a limited government. It is confined to the exercise of powers expressly granted, and such others as may be necessary for carrying those powers into effect. And it is at all times an especial duty to guard against any infringement on the just rights of the states. President Fillmore promoted, uh, uh, as president, uh, he promoted Great Lakes lighthouses and harbor improvements. And he was able to uh, work with Congress to have uh, $2 million uh, a- allocated for waterways from San Diego, California, to Charleston, South Carolina, and a seawall in Buffalo, improvements on the Hudson River. He also, President Fillmore also promoted a U.S. mint in California for gold there, since, because there was the gold rush, and that was implemented in San Francisco. He worked to reduce postage rates from 5 to 12 cents to 3 cents everywhere but the West Coast, and from 40 cents to 6 cents for letters or for mail going to the West Coast. And this was a wonderful thing because it stimulated commerce and communication, really helped people communicate, helped people learn more because there was lots of, a lot of newspapers being printed. He also promoted a transcontinental railroad, which uh, was you know, very important for uh, transportation. He negotiated, President Fillmore negotiated for the ro- release of Hungarian patriot Louis Kosuth from a Turkish jail, who was in jail in Turkey, because well, Hungary was close to the uh, part of the Ottoman Empire. He also signed a treaty with Switzerland. Millard Fillmore had a lifelong fascination with foreign places, again, because of his, he became a, such an educated person, very, very curious, and read a lot of books. He's very interested in foreign places and cultures. He loved books, maps, and geography, always wanted to expand his knowledge. Yeah, he became, as vice president, he was regent of the Smithsonian Institute. And again, earlier, he had gained a charter for the University of Buffalo. Now, at that time, uh, Japan was closed to the outside world. They called it the Hermit Kingdom. They, had, they, there was, they didn't, the Japanese did not want relations with other countries. And uh, President uh, Fillmore, uh, he, he, he spearheaded an effort to open Japan to the outside world by sending Commodore Matthew Perry and the U.S. Navy to Japan on a mission to attempt to, to get the Japanese to open up to the outside world and, and trade with foreign countries. So Fillmore, President Fillmore wrote a letter to the uh, Emperor of Japan and uh, they prepared this trip, and he gave all every encouragement he could to Commodore Matthew Perry, and uh, they, they they gave them uh, pres- they arranged for a number of, of things uh, gifts that uh, Perry would bring and to give to the Japanese to try to impress them and entice them, get them interested in trading with the outside world. And these things included a toy railroad, a telegraph, farm machinery, a camera, a revolver, a rifle, a bird book, an animal book, and 100 gallons of Kentucky bourbon. Fillmore's uh, choice of, he, ch- he chose Matthew Perry, and it was a wise choice because Perry did a good job. And, they, and, and mission, the mission was accomplished, not under President Fillmore's time, but it was initiated by him and became a, became a, became a reality. Japan did open to the outside world as a result. Now, in 1851, in September, Louis Kosuth, the leader of Hungarian independence, 
movement against Austria. He came to the United States. It was very popular, and there, were a lot of, there was a lot of support for him. However, President Fillmore did not support Hungarian independence. He believed this would inspire Southerners to, uh, to, to uh, fight a war of independence themselves against the North, and he didn't, be- he didn't think this would, this would be a problematic. 1852, uh, Commodore Matthew Perry left Norfolk, Virginia in November with uh, six ships of the U.S. Navy and uh, started this long, long trip. And this was a, a great achievement. Uh, Miller Filmer was a visionary interested in the exotic countries. Perry and the U.S. Navy arrived in Japan in July of 1853 after Millard Fillmore left office. In 1854, a U.S.-Japan treaty was signed under the leadership of President Franklin Pierce. So that became a reality. Also in 1851, the French had tried to make a Hawaii a French colony, and President Fillmore had opposed that and helped preserve Hawaiian independence. And of course, which led eventually, it became part of the United States, Hawaii. August of 1851, Narciso Lopez was added again with 400 men. He sailed from New Orleans to Cuba, attempting to conquer Cuba. Uh, which was a Spanish colony, and have it become a a U.S. slave state. And this mission was a disaster. Half of the the guys were killed. There was fighting with the Spanish army. Fifty Americans were arrested and executed in Cuba. 160 prisoners were sent to Spain. There were riots in New Orleans, and the Spanish embassy was attacked. Eventually, of course, the U.S. did take uh, Cuba in 1898. 1851, there was an, an enormous backlash against the fugitive slave law. Uh, the critics, uh, critics said that uh, President Fillmore had no sympathy for runaway slaves. Well, I'm sure he did. He was a very good man, but he felt this threatened the Union. The Chicago City Council passed a resolution declaring the law null and void. Frederick Douglass, who, was an escape, who had escaped from slavery, became a strong leader in the abolitionist movement. He suggested the killing of fugitive slave catchers. Uh, there was a lot of resti- resistance in the North to the law, and this actually stimulated the abolition movement. And Millard Fillmore hated abolitionists. He f- believed they, he, he knew their cause was right, but he believed it threatened the country, break up the country. And again, they were, they were arrogant, and this was a real problem. The way they, if you didn't support them, they condemned you as evil. The Compromise of 1850, uh, the whole purpose was to fight the Southern Secession Movement, and that, that, uh, that succeeded. Again, this, uh, another thing is those who, had, those who helped escape slaves uh, were charged with treason. However, there were no convictions, no convictions. In 1851, Supreme Court Justice, uh, uh, the, the Supreme Court Chief Justice, had this to say about one treason trial. Treason meaning uh, tre- treason for helping escape slaves in the North. Quote, did you hear it? Three harmless, non-resisting Quakers and eight and thirty wretched, miserable, penniless Negroes armed with corn cutters, clubs, and a few muskets and headed by a miller in a felt hat, without a coat, without arms, and mounted on a sorrel nag, levied war against the United States. Blessed be God that our union has survived the shock. Miller Fillmore, a relent- again, his critics charged that he relentlessly pursued prosecution of Northerners who interfered with the Fugitive Slave Act. And this was in, the, uh, in, in an atmosphere of Northern anti-slavery hostility. Well, it was the law. And he believed in, in the rule of law. Now, his uh, wife, Abigail, she struggled with her duties as first lady because of poor health. And their daughter, Mary, stepped in and very often served as, uh, in her behalf as first lady. In 1851, the Library of Congress caught fire and uh, they had a bucket brigade to try to put it out. With, and Millard Fillmore and his cabinet got in the bucket brigade, handing buckets of water to help put out the fire. Also, 1851, Abigail found no, no dictionary or Bible in the White House. She saw, well, this is no good. And so she started, Abigail Fillmore started the White House Library, and Millard was able to get $2,000 from Congress for that purpose. Abigail also convinced her husband, Millard Fillmore, to end flogging in the Navy, flogging when they would beat guys for, uh, 
for misbehavior. 1852, Harriet Beecher Stowe's uh, uh, classic novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, was published and became a sensation. Uh, in the story, there's this bare story of a barefoot slave, Eliza, jumping from ice flow to ice flow on the Ohio River. Because if, she, if they, she was going from Kentucky to Ohio, oh, Kentucky, a slave state, and if they got into uh, Ohio, they were free. Uh, so that's why you know the, the, the Ohio River was so important for them, crossing the Ohio River. In this novel, Simon Legree is this uh, vicious plantation overseer, and Uncle Tom is this is the uh, is really the hero in the book. He's resilient and saintly. It's too bad Uncle Tom became a, a, an object uh, of scorn. It's like a, a derogatory word, but it's actually uh, he was he was actually the hero of the book. It's too bad. Uh, the book the book sold three hundred thousand copies in one year and fueled the anti-slave movement, the abolition movement. 1852, there was direct train service between New York City and Chicago, which started that year. So that was really the, the transportation revolution was continuing. Also in 1852, the at the White House, the cast iron stove was re, replaced the open hearth fireplace cooking. 1852, Daniel Webster wanted to run for president. However, one but he was he was an old guy, and one, and one observer said that Webster was a quote poor decrepit old man whose limbs could scarcely support him, whose sluggish legs were somewhat concealed by an overhanging abdomen. Now, in the presidential election of 1852, there was strong support in the South for Millard Fillmore for re-election, and he was a strong candidate. Uh, the other, another candidate uh, was uh, in the Whig Party was Winfield Scott, who was a Mexican War hero. And at the Whig at the Whig convention, Scott Winfield Scott got the nomination for president and defeated Mill, Millard Fillmore. For, so Fillmore did not receive the Whig Party nomination in 1852. The Democrats nominated Franklin Pierce. Uh, again, he was uh, didn't get the nomination. Um, at, actually, that same year, Henry Clay and Daniel Webster died, so that was really the end of an era. And in November, the Democrat Franklin Pierce was elected as the 14th president. President Fillmore's final message to Congress in December of 1852, he said, quote, "...called by an unexpected dispensation to a position of higher trust at a season of embarrassment and alarm, I entered upon its arduous duties with extreme diffidence." I claim only to have discharged them to the best of a humble ability, with a single eye to the public good, and it is with a single eye to the public good that I leave the country in a state of peace and prosperity. So March of 1853 was the end of Millard Fillmore's presidency and the inauguration of Franklin Pierce. Abigail was uh, sick. She got sick at the inauguration from the cold weather, and she died a month later. Very, very tragic. Now, President Fillmore was was planning to return home to Buffalo for his legal for his legal to continue with his legal practice. On his last day as president, uh, Congress authorized the Transcontinental Railroad Survey, which is which is what he had worked for and promoted. Well, that concludes today's presentation. We'll wrap up next time, The Life, of Mil Life and Times of Millard Fillmore. I hope you have a good history book to read or, or have one or find one. There's so many amazing history books that have been written. You might consider checking out our website, Adventures in History with Peter J. Ray, peterjray.com. So far, we've made 608 history videos in seven areas, world history, American history, book reviews, poetic tours, Cleveland baseball, family history, and autobiography. You also might consider checking out our podcast, Adventures in History. Thanks so much for watching. I really appreciate it. God bless you. Take care. And I'll see you next time.